welcome to this event that uh, has been really about a year in the making. Um, I'm Leslie Langbert. I have the great pleasure of serving as the executive director for the College of Social and Behavioral Sciences Center for Compassion Studies. Um, for those of you that might be thinking, wow, I didn't realize that the U of A had a center for compassion studies. Uh, we are in our third year, and it's a really fantastic um, set of, of work. Our mission is, is quite powerful. It's an interdisciplinary center that's really uh, designed to investigate the impact of cultivating human traits, including compassion, gratitude, altruism, forgiveness, mindfulness, um, and assess and investigate its impact in cultivating these skills in a deeper way on human behavior, human well-being, uh, both at the individual level and at our larger societal level. One of the things that's been very, uh, very important to me is in thinking about how we cultivate compassion and how cultivating compassion really requires that we value all beings, um, that we really expand our, our circle of those that we find dear to be more inclusive. And for me, that really resonates to extend to all living beings. I had the great um, fortune about a year ago to go hiking in Nepal. And I was in Kathmandu the night before um, we left for the trek. And I came across a copy of Kathleen Dean Moore's book, Moral Ground, Ethical Action for a Planet in Peril. And I immediately knew that we needed to bring her to Tucson to share wisdom. And I am absolutely thrilled that she's here with us tonight um, and tomorrow morning for a workshop. I want to tell you more about, about Kathleen. Um, she is a nature writer. She's an essayist and a novelist. She is an environmental advocate. She's a philosopher. As a writer, Kathleen is best known for award-winning books of essays about the nature that surrounds her home in the Pacific Northwest. But her growing alarm at the devastation of the natural world led her to focus her writing on the moral urgency of action against climate change and habitat destruction. As a distinguished professor of philosophy at Oregon State University, she taught critical thinking and environmental ethics. Two years ago, she left the university to focus on writing and speaking about climate change full time. Her writing has been widely published and anthologized, appearing in um, such publications as Orion, High Country News, The Utney Reader, New York Times Magazine, Conservation Biology, Audubon Magazine, and many others. Um, as you saw when you came in, um, if, particularly if you came in through the side door out here, uh, her books are available for sale. Um, she will be available after this evening for signing. Her most recent work is Piano Tide, a novel. Please join me in welcoming Kathleen Dean Moore. Thank you, Leslie. Hello, Tucson and Albuquerque. You know, I've just come down from Oregon where what you hear when you go outside is mostly rain in the gutters. Sometimes you'll hear a frog. So it's really great to come down here where I can hear all this desert music, right? The, the quails, the yahoo, like cowboys, yahoo. And, and those clackety cactus wrens in, in Allison's backyard, those dear little verdans with their tiny songs. And of course, all those lonesome doves. So, um, Really, has there ever been a time in planetary history when the earth was more full of song? Thomas Berry calls this the most lyric period in planetary history. So I'm sure those ancient protozoa and those like comb jellies probably bubbled and popped, right, in the ancient seas. And I hear that the dinosaurs brayed and hissed. But the birds and mammals now 
Oh, how we sing and hum, right? Including we full-voiced, two-legged mammals who sing all about our sorrow and our joy. Joy, joy, sisters and brothers. Jeremiah was a bullfrog. Sing with all the sons of glory. Sing the broken-hearted hallelujah. I'm so lonesome I could cry. We shall overcome. So our ability to sing out, our ability to speak up, has never been more important because I would submit that we find ourselves facing a crisis that is largely silent, as quiet as ice melting, as quiet as water rising, quiet as desiccation, quiet as children dying, quiet as websites going dark and data going underground, quiet as my scientist friend who was too afraid of deportation to speak at a science march. And honestly, quiet as people who are most concerned about climate change. The Yale Center for Climate Communication says that six, to ten, six out of 10 Americans think that climate change is important. But of those, fewer than half say the words climate change in any given month. And worse, <laughs> the effects of climate gl global warming are felt most directly by people who have no voices at all and can't speak up in their own defense. So who are these quiet ones? They are plants and animals, small children, the marginalized people all around the world on the edge, geographically and economically, people who are at the very edge of survival, and the countless billions, the millions of creatures in the future generations, none of them can speak. Pope Francis, he says, look into the faces of those whose pain has no voice, but who scream up to heaven. And when we look into their faces, we will find our own voices. So this, I submit, is the work of our generation, to lift our voices in defense of those who cannot speak. So isn't it a stunning time? It's a stunning time to be alive, this pivotal time when you could drive a nail through this decade and the fate of the earth and all its songs would just shiver there in the balance. This is a decade when we'll either find a way to live in harmony with other lives and with the great systems or we will watch them fray and fall silent. And who would have guessed, does it startle you to think that it turns out to be us? who are charged with making this great turning. You know, who would have asked for this? I would not have. If you ask me, I would rather have lived in the time somewhere between the advent of modern de uh, dentistry and maybe nuclear weapons, somewhere in there. But instead, here we are. I mean, it's our job, it's our time. Um, I feel like Noah. You know, when God asked him to build the ark, Noah said, I'm old, I'm tired. Why me, oh Lord, God damn. That's just the way we are, but here we are at this tipping point. It could go either way. So let's check in. How are we doing? The same Yale Center on um, Climate Communications has done some polling of those people who are alarmed or concerned, very concerned about climate change. Of those people, I presume that's us, 85% are afraid. Are you afraid? 81% are sad. Are you sad? 79% are angry. 61% feel helpless. All right. They didn't ask about people who feel resolute or people who feel engaged and determined. I don't know why the Yale Center didn't ask about these things. So let me ask you, on this scale of 1 to 10, okay, this is a poll, scientific. 10 means climate, schmimate. We are the lords of the universe. We will get this done. It's going to be technology that saves us or it's going to be God that saves us. I don't know how, but somehow we will be saved. That's 10, okay? Number one is, oh, shit. It's already over, okay? So think a minute. Where are you on this scale? One, 10. Now, may I see all the tens? Raise your hand. May I see the nines? You're all welcome to look around and see. May I see the eights? We got an eight. <laughs> going, what's going? Uh, sevens. Six. Five. 
four, three, two, one. I have never been in a more despondent group. <laughs> Is it because we're at a university? Is it, I don't know, interesting. Is it the times? Maybe, I don't know, it's the end of a hard week. I don't know, okay. So, we have some work to do. Our grandchildren are, wanna, are gonna wanna know the story of the time. Was it like this? These storm clouds building on the horizon and desperate people pushing into the cities and shouting and gunfire and bullies? Or was it this great wave of moral affirmation of the rights of all people and the inherent worth of the earth? Was it exciting, these new ideas, this sudden freedom from the old patterns of destruction, the weepy joy of relief and redemption? And our grandchildren are going to ask how, how at the last possible moment did that generation crank that great heavy creaking wheel of the world to make the great turning? So let's ask those questions. I have three questions to discuss tonight. The first one is, is Noah's question, number one, why? Why me? Why any of us? Why have we got to do this work to keep the extractive growth industry from wrecking the world? That's the first question. Number two, what is standing in our way? Number three, what are we going to do about it? Okay, right? Number one, why me? So you might hear I got a lot on my mind. I got to get the kids to soccer tournament. And if I don't finish my paper on the comparison of the crowns of 16th century queens, I won't pass this course. And after I get the kids to bed, I have to go to my job at Pizza Hut. And my mother is sick, and my husband is a rat. And climate change might be a Chinese hoax. And now you're asking me to care. Yep, we are asking you to care. So why? And part of the answer comes from scientists, and I don't need to rehearse this, that's an act of mercy. Um, you already know, if we don't put the brakes on climate change now, it probably can't be stopped. I remember giving a talk like this 10 years ago and saying, if we don't do this in the next 10 years, it probably can't be stopped. Here we are. Um, these planetary changes are happening far more quickly than people anticipated. We may soon pass the points of no return. Then there is no going back no going back to the climatic conditions that nurtured life. The systems that sustain us will then be irretrievably destroyed, and the sounds of the earth will just be the whistle across those melting poles. And Bill McKibben raises the question of whether the planet can stand the president's agenda. Even, he says, even when we vote him out of office, Trumpism will persist, a dark stratum on the planet's geological history. In some awful sense, he says, his term could last forever. So preventing this is going to be a long, hard slog. And the longer we wait, the harder it's going to be until it can't be done at all. We know this. But why is it our problem to solve? My answer is that the duty to prevent catastrophic climate change is a moral obligation. And it's based on the sanctity of all creation and the dignity of all people, present and future, and all of these equal claims to decency and, and justice. So a lot of people say that climate change is a political issue, and of course it is. A lot of people say, generals say, that it's a national security issue, and of course it is. And people say it's an economic issue, and of course it is. Engineers want you to think it's a technological issue, and of course it is. But fundamentally, it's a moral issue, and it calls for a moral response. It's not just astonishingly stupid to wreck the world, it's wrong. So I don't want to be afraid to say it, to take whatever we need from this earth to nurture our profligate lives and to leave a ransacked and destabilized world for the children, that's unspeakably selfish. And when big oil executives to increase their profits, already unimaginable profits, what Bill McKibben calls the biggest profits in the history of money, when to increase these profits, they knowingly take down the great systems that sustain life on Earth. That's moral wrongdoing on a cosmic scale. We can't be afraid to say that. And don't say they didn't know. 
their own scientists told them 40 years ago. When we had a good chance to protect ourselves from global warming, except for this criminal failure to warn. So the fossil fuel economy I submit now joins the slave economy as moral poison. And people say, oh, ethics, schmethics, of course you think about, about uh, this as a moral problem. You're a moral philosopher. But actually, morality has no power against economics. People are basically selfish, and they're not concerned about their duties to others, and they're especially not concerned about their duties to others who are different from themselves. So what you say about ethics is simply impotent. Well, I think that's a misreading of history. And I think that if you look at American history, every major change in that history has been the result of a rising wave of moral affirmation of a great moral principle. These rising waves of affirmation. For example, we hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal. That's a moral principle if there ever was one. And the great European monarchies fell like dominoes. Or all people held as slaves within any state shall be then thenceforward and forever free. And the direction of history reversed its flow. Or I have a dream that one day this nation will rise up and the troopers and the snarling dogs stumble back. Hell no, I won't go. I don't want to say that any of this work is done. But I do want to say that it has begun, and it began with a rising wave of affirmation of what is right and worthy and good. So I think it's our work to say it out loud, a new declaration of rights, something like this. All beings have an absolute right to a healthy and life-sustaining planet, yes? And this right overrides the presumed license to plunder the common heritage and destabilize the future of the planet, right? and a new dream to stand beside Martin's dream, and I can hardly say this without crying. Earth shall be healed and whole again. Okay, so I'm a philosopher though, and I know I can't just say these things, I can't just pronounce what I think about, about um, the ethics of all this. I have to give reasons to support my views. And I am committed to moral reasoning this. The reason public discourse that allows us to affirm our beliefs and then check them against actions our own and our others. The thing is that scientists have reached this great consensus about the facts of climate change, backed up by evidence, and what we need is a corresponding consensus about the moral urgency of climate change, backed up by a clear idea of our values. You might say that if all we had to go on was the science, we would have a world without a compass. And if all we had was the ethics, we would have a compass without a world. So we need what science provides and we need what ethics provides, this moral affirmation, in order to come to any conclusion about what we ought to do. So the scientists bless their hearts, they are so courageous and good, they have done their work and they continue. Let us praise and defend science. And then let's say, okay, let's see if we can do the same kind of work with the same kind of attendant, uh, attention, and maybe wouldn't it be wonderful, the same kind of funding, on the moral side of this. So we say, let's do this work. What do we dream? What is worthy of us? What is good? What is just? What is fair? Uh, what do we seek? And what is, what, what is not worthy of us? So my colleague and I um, embarked on a project that we called Moral Ground. And we contacted 100 of the world's moral leaders, people like Desmond Tutu, Wangari Matai, Thich Nhat Hanh, Karl Safina, the Dalai Lama, and in, in fact, Bell Hooks, who's on campus today. Um, and we asked them to answer in 2,000 words or less this question. Do we have an obligation to leave the future? Let's see, I'll get this right. Do we have a moral obligation to the future to leave a world as rich in possibilities as our own? Oh my goodness, uh, they, including Allison, sent back beautiful responses, very short responses. Um, my colleagues and I set them all out and they fell into 14 different categories of reasons. No matter what worldview you brought to that question, you would find an answer that would speak to you about your moral obligation to the future. 
Now, I don't want to go through 14. That's another act of mercy tonight. But I do want to talk about three of them. And I picked out three of these reasons why we have this obligation to speak about. And I chose the ones actually that speak most strongly to me, thinking they also might speak to you. We have to stop, we have to work to stop or slow, to push back against climate change because number one, climate change is a failure of reverence for the natural world. Number two, because climate change is a betrayal of the children. And number three, because climate change is a global injustice and a massive violation of human rights. Okay? So let's start with number one. That's usually the best. Um, I'm claiming that climate change is a failure of reverence for this lovely singing world. Do you know this Mary Oliver poem? It goes like this. It goes, it is our nature not only to see that the world is beautiful, but to stand in the dark under the stars or at noon in the rainfall of light, frenzied, wringing our hands, half mad, saying over and over, what does it mean that the world is beautiful? What does it mean? Well, I'll take a stab at answering that. What does that mean? But I have to tell a story to do it, okay? So my husband is a scientist. If you ask him, he is a hard scientist. A self, how many self-described hard scientists do we have? Oh my goodness, one, two. <laughs> okay, so the rest of you kind of know what a hard scientist is anyway, and you should see us, the philosopher and the scientist, trying to, to paddle a canoe in the dark. We got the philosopher in the bow, the scientist in the stern, and I'm rejoicing in the sounds of the night, and Frank is explaining the biomechanics of frog song. So he says, imagine blowing up a balloon, he says. Now he says, imagine blowing it up twice your size. Now he says, hold it there and tremble all night. The energetics of this music, he says, are so tough. There's so much energy expended that it could kill a frog. Some, trees, some tree frogs only have enough energy to sing for three nights. Three trembling nights. Imagine that, he says. Imagine the silence of the frogs on day four. So I do. So I'm sitting there quietly listening to that silence. And then he says, now, imagine swallowing a moth so big that you have to push it down your throat with your eyeballs. So we look across the lake, and the path of the moon is glittering with the discarded wings of a trillion flying ants, just glittering. And we look at the moon itself that's bulging out between black mountains, and we note just in passing that we ourselves are sailing at a zillion miles an hour through the darkness, spinning in a spiral galaxy, slung across space, slung out with all these singing frogs and the quiet ones, all of us up to our eyeballs in swamp. And if we think about our own sparkling minds, you know, the, there's these minds on this sparkling lake and the molecular structure of awareness. If we think about the biochemistry of celebration, if we think about the universe singing its own praises in these two languages, science and philosophy, we have to hold on so we don't dump the canoe, right? We're astonished, yes, and we're shaken. So here's what I think it means to, to think, what it means that the world is so beautiful. Here's what I think that means. That this profound seeing, this, this powerful seeing through the scientific and the philosophical lenses, this sense of the endless wonder of the world, this impulse to honor the world, it has radical moral consequences because it closes the distance between what is and what ought to be. And the same impulse that says, this is wonderful, is the impulse that says, this must continue, right? If this is the way the world is, extraordinary, surprising, beautiful, mysterious, contingent, then this is the way I ought to act in that world, with gratitude and celebration, with caring and respect, and above all, with a sense of responsibility to care for it, that it may continue to be. 
That said, in the past 40 years, since 1970, how many people remember 1970? It was the year in which the Beatles um, broke up. Now that reminds you all what that, that the importance of that year. Uh, in those years since the Beatles broke up, <laughs> it's not funny, 39% of terrestrial wildlife is gone. 39% of marine wildlife is gone since the Beatles broke up. 76% 76, 76 of freshwater wildlife is gone, much of it in the desert southwest. The greatest extinctions are in the poor countries with losses of 58% because the wealthy countries are outsourcing their environmental destruction. And Thomas Berry wrote, it's our generation that is witnessing the end of the era we evolved in. My generation has done what no previous generation could do because they lack the technological power. And what no future generation can do because the planet will never again be so beautiful or abundant. What is the cause? Deforestation, dramatic loss of habitat, over-harvesting of the land and sea, and climate change, the wildfires, the dried playas where there once were lakes, the melting ice caps, these warming, rising, festering seas. So unless we act against climate change, I'll die in a world that is half as life-drenched as the world I was born into, and so will you. And my children, when they go out for a walk, will tear out half the pages in their field guides before they go. They won't need those pages. So that's reason number one. We have an obligation to stand against the ruinous warming of the planet because the world is wonderful. Number two, if we let climate change blow up, we have betrayed our love for our children. According to a new letter from 500 scientists led by a team from Stanford, unless all the nations of the world take concrete immediate actions, by the time today's children have grown middle age grown to middle age, the life support systems of the earth will be irretrievably damaged. Who are these children? I know one of them. Her name is Zoe, and she's my granddaughter. And I imagine that many of you have a Zoe yourself. At bedtime, she sings and giggles herself to sleep. The um, song she's singing these days is Laugh Kookaburra, Laugh Kookaburra, Gay Your Life Must Be. You know this song. And as she sings that, she gradually falls asleep. When Zoe is middle-aged, the Earth's life support systems will be irretrievably damaged. And then when I think of Zoe, I think of all the children around the world singing or crying themselves to sleep, all the beloved babies of all colors and continents. Obviously, the children didn't make this mess. They do not deserve what is coming at them. Nevertheless, they're going to have to live in whatever is left of the world after we get done with it. They'll live in a world of violent, chaotic weather, northerly spreading disease, water shortage, collapsed agricultural and fishery systems, wars for resources, and massive movements of people who are driven from their homes by flood or wildfire or the failure of their crops. That's a failure. That's a betrayal of the children. So why do we have any duty to these new ones? Um, here's my friend Brian Doyle. He writes, because we swore and vowed to every God we ever imagined or invented or dimly sensed that we would care for the children with every iota of our energy when they came to us miraculously from the sea of the stars. Because they are the very definition of innocent, and every single blow and shout and shiver of fear that rains down on them is utterly undeserved and unfair and unwarranted. And because we used to be them, and we remember dimly what it was like to be small and frightened and confused. And I also would add, because we promised them. Who hasn't held a child in her arms and promised them the world? So that's what obsesses me. And I want to read you then a little story, okay, from this, this is from Great Tide Rising, and it's um, a, a very shortened, foreshortened um, essay called Ring the Angelus. The dateline is May 25th, 2025. 
So you see, I'm writing from the future. All those years, the Swainson's thrushes were the first to call in the mornings. Their song spiraled like mist from the swale to the pink sky. That's when I would take a cup of tea and walk into the meadow. Oh, there was music in the mornings all those years. In the overture to the day, each bird added its call until the morning was an ecstasy of music. Evenings were glorious too. The frogs sang and sang. They sang all evening and into the night. They sang while garter snakes, their stomachs extended with frogs, crawled finally under the fallen bark of the oaks and stretched their lengths against cold ground. I don't know how many frogs there were in the pond then, thousands, tens of thousands, clumps of eggs like eyeballs in aspic. When the eggs hatched, there were tadpoles. I have seen the shallow edge of the pond black with wiggling tadpoles. There were that many, each with a song growing inside it. In the years when the frog courses began to fade, scientists said it was a fungus. When the bats stopped coming, they said that was a fungus too. When the goldfinches came in pairs, not flocks, we told each other the flocks must be feeding in a neighbor's field. No one could guess where the thrushes had gone. The fields were as empty as the perfect emptiness of a bell, the perfectly shaped absence ringing the Angelus, the evening song, the call for forgiveness at the end of the day. As it happened, that was a spring when our granddaughter was born. I brought her to the pond so she could feel the comfort I had known there for so many years. Killdeer waddled in the mud by the shore, but even then, not so many as before. By then, the pond had sunk into its warm, weedy places, leaving an expanse of cracked earth. Ahead of the coming heat, butterflies fed in the mud between the cracks, unrolling their tongues to touch salty soil. I held my granddaughter in my arms and sang to her then, an old lullaby that made her soften like wax in a flame, molding her little body to my bones. She fell asleep in my arms, unafraid. I will tell you I was so afraid. Poets warned us, writing of the heartbreaking beauty that will remain when there is no heart to break for it. But what if it's worse than that? What if it's the heartbroken children who remain in a world without beauty? How will they find solace in a world without wild music? How will they thrive without green hills edged with oaks? How will they forgive us for letting frog songs slip away? It isn't enough to love a child and wish her well. It isn't enough to open my heart to a bird-graced morning. Can I claim to love a morning if I don't protect what creates its beauty? Can I claim to love a child if I don't use all the power of my beating heart to preserve a world that nourishes children's joy? Loving is not a kind of la-di-da. Loving is a sacred trust. To love is to firm, affirm the absolute worth of what you love and to pledge your life to its thriving, to protect it fiercely and faithfully for all time. Ring the Angelus for the salmon and the swallows. Ring the bells for frogs floating in bent reeds. Ring the bells for all of us who did not save the songs. Holy Mary, Mother of God, ring the bells for every sacred emptiness. Let them echo in the silence at the end of the day. Forgiveness is too much for, to ask. I would pray for only this, that our granddaughter would hear again the little lick of music, that grace note toward the end of a meadowlark song. Meadowlarks. There were meadowlarks. They sang like angels in the morning. So that's reason number two. We have an obligation to the children to save a future that they can live in. So now we've come to number three. Climate change is a global injustice and it's on track to becoming the greatest violation of human rights the world has ever seen. Quoting now, our work is to link social and ecological wrongs, the desperate instability of the poor and the fragility of the planet. We have to integrate questions of justice in debates on the environment so we can hear both the cry of the earth and the cry of the poor. Pope Francis. We need, he said, to push back against the globalization of indifference. 
quoting still, we can be silent witnesses to terrible injustice if we think that we can obtain significant benefits by making the rest of humanity, present and future, pay the extremely high costs of environmental deterioration. So, what is he talking about? Consider the food supply in the ocean. An estimated 30 to 40 percent of the carbon dioxide from human activity is absorbed into the atmosphere, from the atmosphere into the oceans, increasing the acidity of the oceans and making life very, very hard for the marine calcifying organisms. Organisms like coral and, critically, the krill and the phytoplankton that are the foundation of the food pyramid. One out of seven people on Earth depend on food from the sea. When the food pyramid comes tumbling down, what will they eat? Or consider fresh water. 68% of the planet's fresh water is stored in ice caps and glaciers. And the ice on the Tibetan Plateau, you surely know this already, waters 10 major river systems that provide irrigation, drinking water, irrigation and power to over 1.3 billion people, nearly 20% of the world's population. When they've melted, that reliable water is gone and floods and droughts will take their place. And what will the people drink then? How far will the children walk to water? Or consider agriculture. As the temperatures increase to, what, 1.5, let us say, to 2% by, let us say, 2040, not so long away, African farmers will lose up to 80% of their croplands for their maize and their millet and their sorghum. And the number of malnourished children in Africa will double. What will the people do then? I mean, honestly, what would you do if your children were starving? And salt water is inundating the great agricultural del deltas in the Southeast Asia. What will the people eat then? And it's not just that people will suffer. They will suffer unjustly because they will be paying the penalty for other people's crimes. They'll get none of the benefits and they will suffer these burdens. We think the world has a refugee crisis now. Where will these people go when they have no water to drink, when they don't have any food to eat, when their fields are flooded, where are they gonna go? And how will they be received? With compassion? Well, we've already seen how much compassion the world has when we think about those who are trying to get away from the cruelty and the, and the intense heat in Syria and Northern Africa. And what does compassion even mean when you have suffering on this scale? It seems to me that the compassionate person is going to be working day and night to prevent what can be prevented from these enfolding injustices. So we could say, I don't believe in this and so I won't be part of it. That used to be good, that's still good and it used to be enough. But now we have to say, I don't believe in this and I won't allow it. And that's gonna mean standing in the way of these carbon spewing petrochemical practices. And it's gonna require a kind of determination and ferocity that we don't usually think of as part of compassion. But it's fierce compassion that we're gonna to have to find in ourselves. Um, Thich Nhat Hanh says, what we have to find is the roar of the lion and the great rising wave. Now, I would be telling you all kinds of lies if I pretended in any way to be an expert on compassion, that's for sure. But I've been invited by the Center for Compassion Studies, so I think I should make a shot at it, right? Um, and to think about what compassion asks of us. So let me tell you the scale of my challenge here with another story. So I was up in Missoula, Montana in the winter and I was at the meeting of the Society of Environmental Journalists and we had just heard a speech by a representative of the American Petroleum Industries who was defending, let's see, it was BP, about the Deep Horizon oil spill. Okay, you've got the setting. He said, this man, a release occurred which was not contained. That's his explanation of the Deep Horizon. A release occurred which was not contained. I thought that was so spectacular that I wrote it on the cover of the book I was carrying. Um, so I was walking out of the meeting with this guy um, and I thought, oh, it's him and me. It's he and I, <laughs> sorry. And uh, this is my chance. This is my chance to begin a conversation with a person that I might otherwise think of as the enemy. 
So I said to him, walking along two by two, my name is Kathy. Thank you for your talk. So tell me, do you have children? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know where I was going, but he did too. And he, okay, get the picture. This guy is way up here. He's really tall. He's got a shaved head. He's wearing this huge black trench coat. He's got shoes the size of aircraft carriers. And he's plodding along like this, and he just turns straight to me. And he lifts his finger in the air, and he says, don't you ever, 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 ever underestimate the power of the petroleum industry. Now, what would you have said? I, I couldn't think of anything. In retrospect, I should have said, that's the first thing you said that I believe. <laughs> but I didn't, and you know why? Because the fact is, I wanted to hold his hand. I'm standing there in high heels, and we're on about three inches of ice, and we're crossing a bridge over a river, and I know I am about to fall on my butt. And he, if we held hands, could keep me from it doing it. And I, I, I think that, unquestionably, he would have held my hand. And that would have been nice. But he didn't. And we separated. And that was the end of my first adventure in climate change compassion. So, um, to tell you the scale of my challenge when I think about compassion, I'll tell you another story. Um, uh, uh, okay, okay, yeah, so, fine. So there was this magazine uh, advertisement and it had a picture, it was a mobile oil advertisement, and it had a picture of the cloud splashed earth and underneath the earth, it had a caption that said, Mother Earth is a tough old gal. That offended me for many reasons. So I wrote back to them and I said, if the earth were your mother, she would grab you in one rocky hand and hold you underwater until you no longer bubbled. <laughs> and then I made the mistake of telling people I had done that. More people have criticized me for that than any other thing. And I feel terrible about it. I am completely abashed. I am ashamed and I thank my dear critics. That said, I'm not willing to give up outrage. Outrage is a measure of love, isn't it? If I didn't love the earth so desperately, it wouldn't make me so mad when people abused it. And it's a moral affirmation, isn't it? That there are standards of behavior that one must not breach. But Leslie, dear Leslie, you're Leslie from the Center for Compassion Studies, has been teaching me, and I've been really grateful. She's teaching me to think of a person as a complex person, as a whole, with many, many forces, and to think about what made, might lead them to act the way they do. What fear, what wounded pride, what love for their children drives them? And the point that she makes is that this is not only compassionate, but it's practical because it opens the door instead of slamming it shut forever. So now, of course, I wish I had just said to him, okay, I get that, but will you hold my hand? Um, so, because we love the reeling world, because we love our children, because we stand for justice and human rights and compassion, those are my three reasons why we have to push back against the wreck and pillage of the planet. Which brings us to question two. With these overwhelming reasons to act, reasons that are based on our deepest and most fiercely held values, why has it been so hard to speak up? Why are we so quiet? What is silencing us? Two mistakes, and I think they are big ones. This mistake, the mistake of thinking that we have met the enemy and he is us. Remember Pogo? Looking at all the litter, we've met the enemy and his us. And the argument is that we don't have any moral license to speak against petrochemicals when we're driving them, when we're wearing them, when we're eating them. Somebody told me that Velveeta cheese was made out of petroleum. I don't know if that's true. And investing in them. So find me, the argument goes, find me somebody pure to speak for you and I will listen. So 
we have, to, we have to listen closely to that, and we have to admit that the extractive growth economy has offered us a terrible bribe, and we have accepted it. We have accepted its terms, and these are the terms. We can have anything we want. Bouquets of Ecuadorian roses, tuna and pineapple, brought in on diesel-powered barges, huge homes and room-sized cars that uh, run on oil, <laughs> every comfort and pleasure, sailing on through the sunlit days, music on demand, movies on demand, everything we want on demand. Delivery, two-day delivery of everything in the universe. It's astonishing, the glory. We can have it all on the condition, on the condition that we never raise our voices to ask where it came from or at what cost, right? At what cost to the planet, at what cost in animal or human suffering, at what cost to the future or to what long-term effect. And as long as we never are, as, as long as we are absolutely silent about the ruined forests and silent about the souring oceans and the deaths that are required to produce these pleasures. That's the deal. If we ask the true costs of fossil fuels, this glittering life is not possible. And the extractive, all-consuming economy reveals itself as a giant going out of business sale. Moral and economic bankruptcy. And then we understand that any culture that prides itself on accumulating wealth instead of sharing it, any culture that gobbles up the fecundity of the planet instead of nurturing it, any economy that eats its own feet, any economy of infinite extraction will kill off the sources of its sustenance. So yes, we have to shake ourselves loose from this indentured servitude, none of us. None of us can sign on to be foot soldiers in the petrochemical industry's war against the world. That needs to be said. But it doesn't follow that we've met the enemy and he's us. It might be one of the biggest triumphs of big oil to make us, the consumers, blame ourselves for climate change, even while the corporations are spending billions to transform us into mindless consumers of self-destructive consumer goods and fossil fuels. To make us blame ourselves, even as they leverage their bribes in Congress, to make sure we don't have any alternative ways to heat our homes or get to work. So when people say we have met the enemy and he is us, we should think about that very carefully. Of course, we should spend and invest and work and travel more thoughtfully. Of course, we should dramatically reduce our use of fossil fuels. That said, these big oil corporations are very happy to claim that they are responding to the public demand when we know that they have been manipulating it. They build and maintain these infrastructures that force consumers to use fossil fuels. They convince the politicians to kill or lethally underfund alternative energy and transportation initiatives. They create confusion about the harmful effects of carbon dioxide. They buy elections, let us make no mistakes, to defang the regulatory agencies that would limit big oil's power to impose risks and costs on other people. We've met the enemy, and I'm gonna do everything I can to make sure it isn't me. But honestly, people, while big oil is externalizing all its other costs on me, I won't let it externalize its shame. So let us get over the notion that we don't have moral license to speak out against fossil fuels. And mistake number, oh boy, 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 we will leave aside mistake number two, only to say this, that um, there are many people who believe that it's over and that there is no hope and that there's nothing, to, there's no point to um, engaging your neighbors in discussions of planet change, it would just annoy them. So we have a situation where there are some people who have a great deal of hope and they think that things are gonna be just fine, although none of them are in this room. <coughs> they think things are gonna be just fine and so they don't have to do anything. So you've got a kind of moral complacency if you hold on too strongly to hope. Hope can be a trap. On the other side, you have people who have this blinding despair. And they think that no matter what I do, it's not going to do any good. So I don't have to do anything. So this blind hope, this blinding despair, I don't have to do anything. <coughs> but the point I want to make is that that's a, that's a fallacy, the fallacy of false dichotomy. Between, because between hope on one side and despair on the other. There's this big space, this great 
country that we call moral integrity, which is simply acting out of integrity, matching what we believe to what we do, so that we live gratefully only because we think life is a gift. And we act reverently because the world is sacred. And we live, I'm totally sorry. <coughs> If I didn't rant, I probably could keep my voice. And we live simply because we don't believe in taking more than our fair share. And we act lovingly toward the world because we love it. We aren't motivated by hope. We aren't paralyzed by despair. We do what we think is right because it's right. And that's where we are, isn't it? Asking ourselves, what is it that I love too much to lose? Then that means a tireless and a fierce and a perhaps tragic defense of the world against those who would wreck it. So here's a quiz. I'm a professor. I give quizzes. <laughs> but I also give hints, as all professors do. And um, the hint, OK, the question is, the quiz question is, if your house is on fire, what do you do? And the hint is, let us just say that your house is the most beautiful and life-sustaining house in the universe. A, not one damn thing. B. Silence the people who called 911 to report the blaze. Fire them, defund them, banish them from public view, threaten and disappear them. C, claim that the fire in that house is caused by the natural fluctuation in sunspots. <laughs> D, if you are a scientist, write a grant to study the effect of fire on children. E, if you are a businessman, Formulate a business plan to corner the market on corrugated metal roofing for hovels. There's got to be a profit in here somewhere. <coughs> F, if you are local government, appoint a commission to study how to adapt to life in the burnt out husk of a house. Or G, for God's sake, put out the fire while there's still something to say. So there's all these to-do lists, you know, and it's interesting to see how they've changed. You know, um, the first two set of to-do lists that we used to get, I, uh, my colleague and I call them light bulb lists because they always start out, change out your light bulbs. Those things are passe. We've already done all those things. They do not seem to have saved the world. <laughs> then you have these um, <clears throat> eco-technical lists. Um, if we start next year, we reduce <coughs> Greenhouse gas emissions by 15% every year forever. How do we do that? Well, immediately stop building the infrastructure to support fossil fuels. No more coal trains, no more coal depots, no more natural gas-fired power plants. Secondly, stop subsidizing fossil fuels. Put a price on carbon that reflects its true costs. And C, switch to no-till agriculture and plant a trillion trees. Joanna Macy has her own list, the eco-Buddhist philosopher. It's three steps, stop the harm, invent a better way, and reimagine our place in the kinship of all living things. Now, I don't have a list, but I am a passionate advocate of creative disruption, of creative disruption, getting in the way of business as usual. And that takes two forms, go and stop. The go part of this getting in the way is to, is to invent better ways to, to live. The better way will drive out the worst and it'll happen fast. So we need to radically reimagine how we feed ourselves, how we warm ourselves, how we catch and share energy. Tracy said it at dinner last night, we have to change everything. And honestly, I do, I yearn for this discourse. I yearn for a new conversation about aspiration and affirmation. What is a good corporation? What is an honorable harvest? What is a good life? What is the best work? How can I make my life into a work of art that reflects my deepest values? That's the go. And then there is the stop. The other form of creative disruption is to get in the way of business as usual. Allison and I at breakfast, she says, you know, she said, it doesn't take that much to mess things up. And she's right. I've been um, working with the valve turners who are four people who on one morning broke into hurricane fence, simultaneously shut the valves on the oil pipelines from Canada, and in that instant, shut down all the oil coming from Canada, all of it, which is 15% of our use of oil. 
And here's what they say. They say, whether it's tankers or trucks or pipelines, these companies can't destroy life on Earth without our implicit permission because the fuels have to travel through thousands of miles of pipelines, and they have to travel on our highways, they have to travel on our railroads. So if people are determined to stop them from doing that, and are willing to take the legal and physical risk to put themselves in the way, we can make sure that we stop business as usual. That would otherwise stop us. We can't just put up with it anymore. The consequences are too great. And another of these valve turners said, I used to think of these companies as so powerful, inevitable, invincible. What tickles me is to see how fragile and vulnerable and frail they are. These pipelines are thin, 28 inches, two and a half million miles of them. But there are tens of millions of people who care about clean water and a future for their kids. Do the math. So that's one way to do it with direct action and civil disobedience. But it hasn't have to be that way. How many of you were in marches since the election? <laughs> Yes, and how did it feel? You know, it used to be that we thought, I thought, that what we needed to actually start to move was a really good leader who would lead us out of this mess. Is it possible? Is it possible that we, what we need is an inconceivably simple-minded, selfish, dangerous, and cruel clown of a leader? A, a mediocre golfer obsessed with wealth and maybe that's the kind of leader we actually need. Um, and and look, look at this. We are suddenly aware of what we really care about. Freedom of speech, human rights, compassion, science, rational decision-making, justice, clean water. Such a great list. Very great. Tremendous. Very beautiful. It is a great list. And we're suddenly moved to action to defend these things. Who would have thought? And Allison points out, yes, sometimes it takes a scare, like smoking cigarettes. People often don't give up cigarettes until they think they're going to die. And then maybe it's time that they could make a change. So, so what, I, what I am noticing is that this reaction to the dangers that are very, very real is joyous and energized. Suddenly, everybody is talking about climate change. Suddenly. Everybody is talking about human rights. And we can see these selfish people falling back. We can see selfishness stumbling over its own feet as congressmen run from their constituents and politicians backpedal. So this is a call to get in the way. And when courageous and clear-minded people find each other, it becomes a powerful force for creative change. We've seen this again and again. Slaves leading other slaves toward the North Star. Crowds singing as they march across a bridge. Mothers bearing their breasts at the gates of the prisons that hold their sons. Women marching in defense of women. Scientists marching in defense of scientists. All the great rising choruses. Sandra Steingrager said, we are all members of a great human orchestra and it is now time to play the Save the World Symphony. You do not have to play a solo, but you have to know what instrument you hold and find your place in the score. That metaphor is beautiful and it's strong, but the truly hair-raising part of that is that there is no score. Nobody has written the Save the World Symphony. We're making it up as we go along. It's not classical music, people. This is jazz with all its risk and glory. So let me just close now with, with Charles Dickens. Where are we now? Charles Dickens said of the French Revolution, it was the best of times, it was the worst of times. It was a time of foolishness, it was a time of wisdom. This is still true, isn't it? But it's a time like no other, and it calls to us in a time of bullies to demonstrate courage, in a time of cruelty to teach compassion, in a time of lies to stand for the truth, in a time of destruction to defend the eager innocence of the natural world. And under the threat of sullen stupidity, to let our imagination soar, not to envision the end of civilization, but to set a compass course for its redemption. Thank you. I want to acknowledge in our audience some of our uh, faculty advisory board members here in the front rows, Dr. Greg Garfin, Deputy Director for the Institute of the Environment. 
Greg, do you want to stand? <laughs> Dr. Al Kasniak, Professor Emeritus, Department of Psychology. And I'm Dr. Al Bergeson, Department Head for Sociology. I'm scanning to make sure I'm not missing anyone. <laughs> All right, so um, I, I'm going to introduce and invite our panelists and actually have them kind of come up one by one as I make these introductions. Um, I'm so, so honored um, that all of these individuals agreed when I asked them to come and have this conversation with Kathleen and to talk about the power of conversation around com compassion and what does it mean in terms of how we move forward? What does it mean for us in terms of our local geography, what does it mean in terms of our local community, human lives, our fragile ecosystem. So our first panelist is Dr. Tracy Osborne. I want to tell you about Tracy. Tracy is an environmental scientist, a scholar, and an advocate. Her research focuses on investigating the ways in which carbon markets and payments for environmental services intersect with resource access forest governance, and livelihoods in forest communities of southern Mexico. She engages in research that explores questions of climate justice in both the global north and south. She's worked throughout Latin America and the Caribbean, most extensively in Mexico and Guyana. She's an assistant professor in the School of Geography and Development here at the U of A. And she is just a, a fantastic human being that I'm proud to call my friend. <laughs> Welcome, Tracy. Thank you, Our next panelist, Allison Hawthorne Deming. Allison is a celebrated writer of poetry, nonfiction, and many works on nature and the environment. Allison has won a number of literary awards. Her writing has been widely published and anthologized. Her work is featured in a tremendously long list of literary publications, um, highly esteemed journals. Uh, she is uh, the former director of the University of Arizona Poetry Center, and she is currently the Agnes Helms Howery Chair of Environment and Social Justice, and she is a Regents Professor of Creative Writing here at the U of A. Her most recent work is Stairway to Heaven, and that's her fifth volume of poetry Please welcome Allison Hawthorne Deming. Our next panelist, Mr. Terrell Johnson, um, is an incredible, incredible advocate. He's a community leader. He's a nationally recognized advocate for Native American communities. And he's a renowned artist. In 1996, Terrell co-founded the Tohono O'odham Community Action Organization. It's a grassroots community organization dedicated to creating positive programs based in the O'odham Himdom? Is that right? Okay. <laughs> the Desert People's Way. In 2002, Terrell and his Toka co-director, Tristan Reeder, were recognized as one of the nation's top leadership teams for their work when they received the Ford Foundation's Leadership for a Changing World Award. As an artist, Terrell is recognized as one of the top Native American basket weavers in the US. His work is in numerous museums. He's won high awards at Santa Fe's famed Indian Market and other highly esteemed art shows. He's an incredibly talented artist, an incredible advocate, and a very, very strong voice for the community, and I'm deeply honored that he's here tonight. Welcome, Terrell. Your moderator for this discussion is the incredible Michael Gill, who is also a faculty advisory board member for the Center for Compassion Studies. Michael's work is on ethics and the history of philosophy. He's the department head for philosophy at the U of A. He teaches coursework on environmental ethics, contemporary biomedical issues, and has a number of uh, published works in those areas, as well as two books 
So with that, I'm going to turn things over to Michael. Thanks very much. And I'm going to ask questions of each of the panelists, but I also would encourage them to say what they want to say. The questions are just jumping off points. Um, we really want to hear what you have to say in response to Kathy's amazing talk. Um, we are being sponsored by the Center for Compassion Studies, and I do want to ask a question about that, which, which Kathy definitely addressed. Uh, global warming threatens to cause harm and suffering on a scale that might be almost impossible for us to intellectually comprehend and emotionally grasp. Are we in a situation now in which our capacities for empathy and compassion and imagination have just kind of given out? And to what extent do we have to change our capacities? To what extent does the great turning that Kathy talked about require a rethinking of compassion, a rethinking of imagination and empathy? And if so, how do we go about that? We'll start with Tracy and we'll go this way. Thank you, Michael. Um, I really appreciate the opportunity to think about these questions of climate change through the lens of compassion and, and empathy. It's, it's definitely um, new for me, but I think it's been incredibly, um, uh, I'm, I'm realizing how important it is to sort of think about this, these questions of, um, of, of empathy and, and compassion. And so I, I don't necessarily think that the fundamental problem is one of a lack of empathy or compassion. I think that they exist, but that these channels can get shut down. When people, especially children, suffer from hunger or malnutrition, some of the, the issues that Kathleen spoke about, um, uh, both of which are exacerbated in certain parts of the world, such as sub-Saharan Africa and other parts of the developing world, these things are absolutely heartbreaking. Or when climate refugees that must leave their homes, uh, and this is already occurring in certain parts of the world in some of the island nations such as Tuvalu and Kiribati, this also hurts. And when we see images or we read in the news about wildlife lo losing their habitats such as polar bears, caribou, and migratory birds, and that the oceans are warming, all of these, these um, important and critically um, devastating issues, these, all of these, these are, are unbelievably heartbreaking. Also, you know, when we think about, when we fly over large scale, areas of large scale mining in the Southwest and mountaintop removal in the Southeast and see the violence imposed on the earth from the extraction of fossil fuels, this is also deeply heartbreaking. And with all of this heartbreak, I believe that our capacity and empathy for compassion actually shut down, and it's just, it's too difficult to handle. So this is where I think imagination comes in. I believe that if we start to imagine the world that we want, this will allow us to open our hearts again and to work toward a more sustainable and socially just world. Importantly, we need to envision a radical transformation of our economy. Constant growth on a finite planet will eventually degrade the system, and we're starting to see that now. So we need a transformation of our economy from the current one that's destructive to a planet, um, to one that's based on ecological principles uh, and social justice and is deeply embedded within the values of society. And we, may, we also may need to be clear about those values and in some cases redefine those values moving away from consumerism and domination of nature to values aligned with earth stewardship. And by earth stewardship, I mean a practice of protecting and sustaining, as well as enhancing the earth's life support system, which also includes environmental sustainability, social justice, and also a recognition of the deep interconnection between humans and the environment. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you, Tracy. Thank you, Kathleen, for that rousing address. So I found myself thinking about William Wordsworth and when he said in the prelude, uh, what we have loved, others will love, and we will teach them how. In other words, we're capable of empathy and compassion and love. 
but we need to be educated in it. it doesn't, it's not a given. It's not a given, particularly in this age. We think about um, you know, some of the helpful terms that have come to us as we've struggled to grow our empathy and compassion in the recent decades during the AIDS epidemic and the worst of it. Um, there was a period when people talked about um, compassion fatigue. When, when so many people were dying, they could not feel it anymore. They couldn't care anymore. They had to help each other. They had to form communities of activism and care in order to wake their hearts up again because there's, we are sensitive and caring creatures. There's only so much you can take. So how do we help each other with the compassion fatigue with these kinds of losses going on in the world? And then the other term that came to me um, is uh, psychic numbing, which I think came to us from Robert J. Lifton talking about nuclear proliferation. Again, something we can't comprehend how terrible nuclear proliferation is. And so we shut down. Our hearts shut down. Our psyches shut down. And we live in, in pleasant denial and buy a lot of more stuff. <laughs> so in, in, in some respects, uh, if we have a more forgiving attitude towards uh, uh, how our silence has perhaps um, enabled uh, climate change to progress as far as it has without rousing activism, such as what Kathleen asks of us. Um, it, it means we have to help each other with the feelings that are associated with this. It, it's not just knowing what's going on, it's knowing how to deal with our feelings and how to help one another with the grief, with the outrage, and not let that be stultifying for us. So uh, I, as a writer, I'm a poet and an essayist, I think the arts have an enormous role to play in that uh, we are able to uh, identify with other people, other species, with those who don't have a voice is what we attempt to do, to enter into or feel our way into others so that uh, we extend the capacity for the imagination to hold others in solidarity and to form communities of shared concern and practice. So I think the arts are absolutely essential and uh, I think that we sometimes have this stereotype of the, the artist as the solitary person who's working by herself or himself for many hours at a time. But also the artist is the person who give, brings us together and brings us into moments where we go to some place deeper, where we feel the kind of essences of life in which reverence, wonder, mystery, again, come alive for us. And we join together in communities of shared purpose. So I think there's there's something on the other side of the great privacy of artistic practice that's absolutely necessary to us, and that's the building of alliance that we need to be strong enough to uh, go forward with the kind of uh, courage that Kathleen is calling us to. Tara? <clears throat> well, thank you again uh, for inviting me to sit on this panel. Um, when uh, Leslie had contacted me to, to be part of this, I was thinking, okay, well, what, what can I bring to this, this panel discussion? You know, and for myself, I was like, well, how can I sound smart? How can I sound intelligent and intellectual? You know, and I was thinking, well, no, it's not that. It's because you know, I think it's where I come from and who I am, and as an indigenous person on this earth. Um, lately, I've been asked to speak and talk to groups about my indigenous and where I come from and where I work. And, you know, the kind of work that I've been doing for my life has always been being a steward of the land. You know, lessons that my grandparents and my parents had given me that was instilled um, as I was growing up. And I was very fortunate that I had that because there's a lot of kids, especially on the reservation, that don't have that anymore. But I was very fortunate to spend the time with my grandparents while they were on this earth to learn how to respect and take care of the land. And that goes with a lot of indigenous groups around the world. You know, and we've known that from birth. And you know, you take care of a gift that creator had made for you. Because if you don't, it will um, get sick and it can kill and it can die. And we've known that. So when you talked about um, you know, the, the, the sound of the wind and the birds singing. You know, we have words specifically for those things that you hear and smell. Like right now, I don't know today, it was kind of windy and blowy and you could smell a hint of wet earth. 
You know, there's a phrase, there's an awesome word for that. You know, but we don't say that anymore because they're losing that. You know, so from my, my position and what I'm doing right now in my life is looking for people that have the information to share the information to teach, especially in my community, that. You know, and a lot of people say, well, how can we help? You know, helping is having conversations and opportunities like this to share and to start com talking to each other and start figuring out how, as a group of human beings on this earth, can work to save our planet, to make it better for our future. You know, and so I um, started looking back at the work that we've been doing, what I've been doing for the past 20 years, officially as a, a um, community organizer. And that was from the very beginning, just teaching what I learned from my grandparents is planting, putting seeds in the ground, you know, and seeing those seeds grow and producing food that would feed my people. And we struggled for a very long time because we were dealing with what was happening with my parents when they were going to school in the boarding school age, where they actually were beaten and punished for practicing and talking about planting, talking about the smells in the, in, in the wind and the birds singing. They were trying to have the indigenous beaten out of them so that when they got back home, they didn't know how to plant. They didn't know how to sing. So um, when I was growing up, my parents purposely did not teach me my language. They didn't want me to learn those things so I didn't have to be beaten in school or locked in a closet. But thank God my grandparents taught me not necessarily the language, but the ideas and the practices of what they've learned about respecting the earth, respecting the clouds, respecting the wind, the animals, and passing that on. And it's really simple. I mean, it doesn't take a scholar or a scientist to understand that when you see something bad going on, you know, you can fix it. You know, those kind of things are as simple as going out and saying, okay, it's going to be a sunny day today just by looking out the window. Um, and that's what I do as a community organizer on the reservation where I'm from. And it's me finding, because I, I love to believe that I know everything, but I don't. So again, as a community, there are certain people in the community that know certain things. There's the healer. There's the cook. There's the um, wise person that knows these songs. There's a singer. There's weavers, you know. And for myself, my job, I feel, is connecting everybody together so we can start talking to figuring out how we can continue to live on this earth in a clean, safe way. You know, so, um, yeah, that, I think that's what I have to say. Kathleen? Um, it's, it's thrilling, thrills me to hear you talk about all the arts, and I think that the, 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 the problem that you pose for us is that, yes, these are, these are truths that could turn us to stone. Um, <clears throat> um, I think about uh, Friedrich Nietzsche, who said, we have art in order not to die of the truth. And I think that that's right, that it's art that opens our hearts without breaking them and allows us to confront these truths without being destroyed by them. So the work that you're talking about, the work that you're doing, I think is essential to maybe help address that problem that you're talking about of how, how are we going to ever open our hearts to this without being destroyed by it? Um, I think we have time for another question. Um, as I'm sure a lot of people here can't help but be thinking, uh, people at the highest levels of power uh, deny certain aspects of global warming and are working to dismantle environmental protections. Um, I wonder what you think, either at a global or a very, very local level, you think the most appropriate response is, and whether you think that there's an ethical obligation now, not just to private virtue, but to political action. And if so, what kind you think at both a national, global, and local level? We'll start with you, Tracy. So um, Kathleen reminded us that you know, the changing of the light bulbs and the, you know, the driving of, of hybrid cars, um, both of which I do, is not enough. 
I mean, it's it's definitely something, and we have to you know sort of take take action at the individual level. But because because of the fact that climate change is so deeply um, connected at, um, and driven by our economy, we have this is a it's a collective action problem, and it requires um, collaboration with various groups and groups that you know obviously. You see at the table the environmental groups that work on so-called climate change. But what I think what was really inspiring, I, I had the opportunity to um, participate in the People's Climate March in 2014 in New York. And I think what was in so inspiring to see various groups um, you know, at, you know, of the, there were, you know, over, about 400,000 people there, but various groups that were participating. So you saw, you know, labor, and, you know, there's often been this dichotomy between, you know, sort of jobs and the environment. But you also saw labor present because they were concerned about the toxins, the petro, the, the um, petrochemicals and sort of the toxins in their workplace. Uh, but they were also, they also had kids, so they were concerned about the future of their children. Um, but you also saw faith-based organizations and faith-based groups who, you know, saw themselves and saw hu humans as stewards of the earth. And, uh, you know, so they were also um, participating and marching for climate change. And you, you know, you see sort of grandmothers, you see every, every you know, groups that you, that don't normally, are, are nor not normally at the table, environmental justice organizations. And I think this is exactly the type of, large-scale climate movement, almost a movement of movements that is going to be required. And, and when you link climate change to these, to its drivers of industrialization and, and market-based economies, the growth-oriented um, you know, economy capitalism, when you're able to make those linkages, you get a lot more people to the table. And it's not that you're, you, we need to sort of you know, devise some type of, of connection, those, those connections ex exist. Um, and so I think in collaboration, in, through collective action, we are able to move beyond that, uh, you know, sort of, you know, the inaction that we feel when, when our hearts are so broken. Thank you. Allison? Um, well, a few things. Uh, I think I believe in the small good deed. So, uh, you know, whatever skills each of us have, whatever sphere of influence each of us has, which is very different, the small good deed uh, in the right direction is a thing to do, and it's a compassionate thing to do for care of the world. So, uh, you know, for a lot of us these days, it does mean getting out on the street and putting our bodies out there to be counted with all the others who are standing up. Um, I recently did a reading tour in Spain, and the kids over there in high schools I talked to were really, really, really concerned about what was going on here and wanted to know, you know, what was going to happen. Uh, did they think because of this uh, Trump presidency? And um, I, I had to remind them, as I would remind all of us and myself every day when I'm in a new state of outrage, that um, the majority of the American people um, don't agree with these policies. The majority of the American people want um, aggressive and productive uh, movement on climate change and that the marketplace is going very, very, very fast towards the non-fossil fuel alternatives. So um, there's a lot that we can talk about that's uh, good that's come out of this because we have been catalyzed by having, I'll just say, a monster uh, in charge of the world, the most powerful nation in uh, the world. Uh, so, uh, excuse my understatement, but uh, but uh, I, I, uh, two things I think specific to Arizona that I would mention. Only one percent of American homes have moved to solar power. It's doable now. It's affordable. There remain tax incentives, which may not be there long. I converted my house to solar panels. Every time I want to turn my thermostat down, I say, wait a minute, the sun is giving me this. I can take more. Uh, <laughs> I'm so it's a kind of, uh, it feels like a kind of morally crazy greed to know that I'm actually um, getting my power from the sun. And I, so yes, the light bulbs were great, the recycling was great, but um, I think moving to solar uh, en electric en energy uh, for our homes is something we could really be the poster children for that in the United States, uh, being the state with so much sun. And the other thing about Arizona is I think we can be the poster child, not only for how we deal with water shortage in the future, but also how inextricably linked 
climate change and social justice are because here we feel the border issues with our neighbors, with our students, with our families. This is real. This inhumane treatment of people exacerbated by a very harsh climate. It's very real here. It doesn't get solved by euphemisms and hate in Arizona. And we can speak up and stand for those things, I think, very articulately because we know people who are being made to suffer from these really hostile policies. Thank you. Tara? Yeah, well, um, in October, I actually had an opportunity to go up to the North Dakota for the pipeline to protest that. And, you know, a lot of people said, well, why are you going up there? And I said, because you're so far away. And I said, well, the reason why is because I think at some point they're going to try to hit all indigenous tribes, you know, and they were simply wanting clean water, you know, and having and being up there and being on the front line and seeing elder um, grandmas getting arrested, having water splashed on them, getting pepper sprayed, you know, and all they wanted was clean water. You know, and I, I went up there and I, I did all that and I was up in the front lines and I was scared for my life. I've never been in a situation like that before. But eventually when I got home, you know, we are in the midst of fighting for our culture and our way of life because of this wall that is going to be splitting up our our indigenous land, you know, and it's time that not only do we call indigenous people, but all human people to come and help, you know, and it affects us culturally, it affects us physically, it affects us spiritually, and to see our land divided and torn and raped just for money, you know, for, for things like that, it, it, it's unbelievable, you know, I'm really glad my grandparents aren't here to see that. You know, they worked the land. My grandfather was a, fa uh, a farmer, and for several years, that's all they did. They, and they had to grow their food because they had to live and eat. And that's how they never had stores. Even right now, on my reservation, um, that we compare the size to the size of uh, the state of Connecticut, there's only one supermarket there. That's crazy. I mean, I actually lived in Connecticut, and in the neighborhood that I was in, there was a supermarket in every neighborhood. You know, and it just, just it's mind-boggling. But um, for myself, talking again and sitting down and conversating and figuring out something to do, you know, but you only can talk so much as well. I mean, it's the actions as well that I really, you know, um, value when I'm talking with groups like this. You know, you get a lot of people saying, well, how can we help? How can we help? You know, um, we can talk about what we can do and how you can help, but it's the actions that come after that that are the most important things. Hmm, what's the last word on this? Um, people ask me, what can one person do? <clears throat> My advice always is to say, well, stop being one person. And then when we come together in concerted action, there is a joy in there that breaks through the brittleness and the grief that we feel when we face all these things by ourselves. And I think our strategy, as we come together, should be to make it very, very costly to do business as usual, to get in the way so that a congressperson realizes that if he is selling out, he may well lose his position, to increase the cost of doing the wrong thing. And if a pipeline com company is deciding whether to put in a pipeline, to make them understand that that's going to be very, very difficult to do and very expensive and very uncertain until the costs and the risks of it aren't worth it anymore. And I think that that, that, that by attaching consequences to their decisions um, is the way to slow them down at least. Um, at least I hope so. Well, thank you very much to all of you. I'm going to turn it over to Leslie. Thank you so much, Michael, for moderating, and deepest gratitude to Kathleen, Terrell, Allison, and Tracy. I feel like, you know, we could continue to hear this wisdom for the rest of the evening. Um, unfortunately, we are, we are at time that we have promised for you. Um, a couple of things that I want to say, um, just in closing, um, you've had now the incredible opportunity to hear how inspiring Kathleen Dean Moore is, how inspiring Allison Hawthorne Deming is. 
Um, their books are available just outside the door, and they will be here for, uh, for a little bit um, <laughs> for signings, if you would um, like to engage in that. Tomorrow morning, Kathleen is um, so generous with her time. I'm really like, you know, wringing as much wisdom out of her in a short period of time as I can. Um, <laughs> but we, uh, sh we are hosting a workshop with her tomorrow morning at 9 a.m. Um, it will conclude at 11, leaving plenty of time for those of us that want to be fired up and get out downtown. Um, so if you have not yet registered for that, we have a few spots um, available, and uh, you're able to, um, the easiest is to just register online. Um, if you are planning to come, yay. Um, and if you're bringing a friend at the last moment, we can register you on site. So again, deep, deep gratitude toward our partners in the Institute on the Environment and the Department of Philosophy and to all of our fantastic presenters this evening. Be well, everyone.